we're finally there. This is the last session. Uh, I'm gonna finish the last module and hopefully I can finish it the first half. And then the second half we can, um, we have a review for the final exam so you can see what we wanna focus on most. So still in module nine, we talked about the Flint taxonomy, a uh, different kind of processor that we can get. SISD, SIMD, MISD, MIMD. And we covered the vector architecture. We talked about different function units in the vector architecture. We talked about the VMIPS instructions as architecture. And the vector processor versus scalar processor. We mentioned that even if we don't have multiple lanes, we still get some benefits for vector processors, which is uh, the savings in the instruction bandwidth, the hazard checking, the efficient use of memory bandwidth. These are the benefits that we can get with vector processors. But because we already know that there is no dependency within a vector instruction, we can use multiple lanes and we can get some parallel processing right there. Okay. And uh, the next thing was superscalar processor. We talked about superscalar processor, n rate superscalar processor, the changes that we need to make to the architecture. In particular, we have to change the ports in the register file the memory side for write and read, and you also have to duplicate or replicate the ALUs, because we want to run multiple instructions at the same time. And the thing that was important when it comes to superscalar was scheduling. So we mentioned that we have to schedule these instructions across different ways to benefit from superscalar processor. And that's we had this example that didn't have any dependencies. And we talk about it, it's pretty straightforward. In every class cycle, you can run two instructions if there's no dependencies, but the dependency becomes very important if you want to have, you want to benefit from superscalar processor. We mentioned we, we covered this topic in uh, module seven, and we were talking about instruction on parallelism. But now this is the same kind of concept in the context of superscalar processor. So, we can have superscalar out of order processes, and for that we have to find the hazards, not only read after write hazards, we also have to find the write after read hazards. Because it's out of order processes, we want to do reordering. It's very important to find those hazards and find the limitations. The whole idea, similar to what we discussed in the instruction of the parallelism, is using the stalls, instead of just stalling the processor, we might as well run an instruction that doesn't have any dependency. Right? So we had an example that we're using register renaming. This is the techniques that we already know. But again, this was in the context of superscalar processor and scheduling instructions for superscalar processes. Okay? So this was an example that we had here. This was a loop. We wanted to unroll the loop. Before unrolling the loop, we could find the dependency. This is the classic dependency of an ALU operation coming after the loop board, and I mentioned the phone wording cannot uh, fix this issue, uh, the data is not ready for the ALU, so we have to have a stall, and now if we reordering, we should be able to uh, run one of these instructions instead of just stalling it, and that instruction here was add immediate, but I mentioned when we want to move add immediate before the store board, we have to make sure that we change the offset such that we're addressing the correct uh, block in the memory. Okay, so when we wanted to schedule this loop, something that we had to pay attention to was, again, dependencies. So we know that we need one clock cycle between this load board instruction and add on sign instruction. In the two-way superscalar processor, we can run two instructions in one clock cycle, right? So when we are scheduling these instructions, we could schedule load board for the first way, and then we could schedule add immediate for the second way. That could work, but the problem was we couldn't run add on sign in the next instruction, in the next clock anyways, because of that dependency. For that reason, one way to fix this problem was not assigning any instruction, not scheduling instruction to the second way. And then we had load board in the next clock, we we'll run look add immediate, and no pressures again in the second way. This way we have one clock cycle between load board and add on sign, then we can use forwarding. 
right? So we have to pay attention when we are scheduling the instruction to different ways and super scaling the processor. We have to pay attention to the dependencies as well. It actually becomes a little bit more complex than what we had in simple SISD pipeline process. Okay. So then we continued with talking about register renaming. The fact that we can have some registers reserved for renaming. And in this case, we mentioned R registers from R0 to R20. And then when we unroll the loop, we can get a lot of dependencies because we keep using the same register. Now we rename the registers. In this case, it's register T0 to R1, R2, and R3. And this allows us to reorder these instructions and make them ready for scheduling in a two-way superscalar processor. And this is where we stopped. So we did talk about this. We reordered this. And we scheduled it for a two-way superscalar processor. And here we can see that we can run, we can fully utilize the capacity of a two-way superscalar processor by using loop unrolling, register renaming, and reordering, and scheduling. Okay? And we could get IPC of two, which was the ideal case for two-way superscalar processor. Any questions so far before we go to the next topic? This was the review of last session. Go ahead. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, Core i7 is a superscalar architecture. And like, what specifications should I look for to understand what, uh, which way superscalar is it? Say two way, three way. So, like looking at a data sheet and everything, they should always match provide this somewhere. I don't think there is a specific you know, way to say, okay, this is like but just looking at the core I set up, find how many ways it has. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then now let's talk about the next topic, which is hardware multi threading. Okay. So, it's a concept for both the MIMD processors. Especially, it's a good thing from a programmer's perspective. But before getting there, let me define some terms. Okay. The first thing is a process. So a process is a program that we run on a computer. For example, we can have a music player, a web browser, an antivirus, and so on. And we can, have multi we can run multiple processes simultaneously on the computers. Then we have a thread. Each process can include multiple threads. Uh, for example, let's say we have a word processor, Microsoft Word. We can have a thread for handling the type, user typing. We can check the spelling. We can have printing. So what it provides to the user is the fact that you can, for example, print something. And while you're printing it, at the same time, you can go and continue typing. You've all seen that, right? When you print something, you don't have to wait for it to finish. You can continue working on your documents. Okay. So when we have multiple threads, a very important concept is uh, the context switching. This is a procedure of switching between threads in a multi-threaded processor. Okay. So to support context switching, uh, a multi-threaded processor should, re should contain more than one copy of is architectural states, with an emphasis on the states, okay? So we, we saw in the super scalar processor that we have to replicate uh, ALUs as well, the functional units as well. In a multi-threaded processor, you don't have to do it. You just need to have uh, copies of the states. So for example, if we have uh, four program counters and 128 registers instead of 32 registers, in a MIPS SISD processor, uh, we can handle four threads. Okay, so it's less expensive than super scalar because we don't have to replicate the functional units and uh, we just need to replicate the PC and the states as I mentioned. Okay, so now let's talk about the different approaches that we have for content switching in a multi threaded processor. The first way is a fine-grained multi-threading. Okay. 
So in the fine grain multi-threading, it's a version of the harder multi-threading that we switch uh, between different threads in each instruction. So basically we have like four threads, we run the first instruction, then we go to the next instruction, the next thread, and the first instruction, the third thread, and so on. And it's good because it can help us uh, hide some of the stalls that we need. For example, the first thread, there's a dependency and we have to stall it. So instead of just installing the thread, we go to the next thread and run the instruction from that thread. Okay? So this can hide uh, both uh, short and long stalls. So long stalls can happen when we have, for example, a last level cache miss. That's going to take longer to go to the main memory, bring the data to cache, and so on. Right? So you can hide those kind of stalls, but the disadvantage is sometimes we have to add some unnecessary delays and some threads. Okay, so for example, thread one doesn't have any dependency and can run instructions after instructions, but because we do context switching, it has to move to the next thread, run the next instruction instead of continuing the first thread. That's the main advantage. You know, it can add some overheads if your threads don't have them, don't need that many stops. Okay, so the next way, the next method for context switching is coarse grain multi-threading. In coarse grain multi-threading, we switch between threads only if we have a major event, like last level cache misses. So advantage here is, again, we can hide some of the long stalls that we need. And then we don't have to keep context switching, we don't have to have a pretty fast context switching between different threads. So those, that issue that we have with the kind of threads that don't have that many dependencies and we want to keep context switching, we don't have that one here. The disadvantage is exactly the same thing too. So if we happen to have a lot of short stalls because of the dependence in the program, because we don't switch the context, we might have some delays in the thread. It really depends on your program. Okay. So how does it look like? Let's have an example of a four-way superscalar processor. It has four threads, as you can see here. Every column is one way. Okay, so every so this is when we have four-way. In this case, for example, we're using the full capacity of a four-way superscalar processor. Okay. So now we have four threads that are doing different tasks. You can see that we have long stalls here and short stalls here. So these are representing different stalls that we can get. Can be based on a dependency or a last level cache miss, right? Long stalls, short stalls. So let's see how it works for a coarse grain multi -thread, multi threading. So in the coarse grain case, we have thread A executing this part, and then we have a long stall, and that's where we do the context switching. We go to the thread B and so on. Okay. So in the fine grain case, uh, we run the first instruction from thread A, and then we go and run the next instruction in thread B, and then thread C, and thread D, and so on. Okay, this is how it looks like. Something that we have to keep in mind is that when we talk about multi-threading, it kind of gives the programmer the illusion of them running in parallel, but in reality, you're actually doing context switching. It's happening, all these threads actually takes a turn to be executed in the processor. But from the user point of view, this context switching happens so fast that you think that it is actually running in parallel. Okay. So there's another type of context switching too, which is simultaneous multi-threading, or SMT. This uses the resources of a multiple issue or multiple base superscalar processor and exploits thread level parallelism as well as instruction level parallelism. So this is the case that we can see here. It's fully utilizing the capacity of a superscalar processor and it's doing context switching as well. So it's a very it's a simultaneous multi-threading. You can see, for example, thread A and thread B. And in the second, when we have two ways that are not being utilized, we can start thread B as well. And the next uh, instruction is going to be executed in the next clock and so on. This is designed to fully utilize the superscalar processor and it's using multi-threading too. Okay? So, any questions so far? Perfect. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about, with this information, let's talk a little bit about the GPUs, which is the next 
our own processor, so we don't spend too much time on it, but it gives you some idea about how it works. So GPUs were initially designed to render high resolution images. They provide massive amount of parallelism through multiple cores. The cores in GPUs are not necessarily faster than in the core that we have in the CPUs. Actually, the CPU cores are faster and more versatile. But the benefit of GPU is that we have a lot of cores that they do a simple you know, task. So they are very good for applications that have that kind of requirement, like rendering high resolution images, it's the same floating point process, but we do it over and over on different pixels. Deep learning is another example. We have a lot of uh, multiply and accumulate operations, a lot of them. It's not necessarily that complex to implement, but when we have multiple cores to handle them in parallel, then we get the benefits. Okay. So the GPU architecture is contains a collection of multi-threaded SIMD processors. Okay. So a GPU can be an MIMD processor composed of multi-threaded SIMD processors. So it's similar to the vector architectures. GPUs work well with data level parallel problems. Right? When you have a lot of data, but we kind of have the same instruction like multiply accumulation deep learning, for example. GPUs work well for them. Uh, but online, unlike most of the vector architecture, GPUs also rely on hardware multi-threading to hide the memory latencies. Yeah. So if you want to look at a multi-threaded SIMD processor, it's very similar to a vector processor. But instead of having a few lanes, so this was a case of a vector processor that we had four lanes, for example. This is what is same multi-threaded SIMD processor looks like in a CPU. So we have way more lanes, hundreds, not thousands of lanes, and then the registers are larger, so the register files that we have here are bigger. We have the load store unit that we also had in the vector processor, right? And then we have the function unit as well. We have a local memory that is shared between the SIMD lanes, uh, within a certain multi-threaded SIMD processor, but they're not shared between different SIMD processors. Okay. So we don't go deeper into the GPU architecture, but you get an idea because we discussed the vector processor in details, and we just talked about the multi-threaded. You can see where it goes. So this is a slide that also compared the CPU and GPU, but I also had a video by NVIDIA that I like this. Let's watch that one. It's a cool video. What opens it? Can you open YouTube here? Single instruction, single data. The data is the paint, the color that you see here, and the task is shooting paintball. Okay? Uh, let me speed it up. Okay, what if you just do in the context of computer architecture? Increase, increase the clock frequency? Increase the clock frequency. Right? 
So in the context of computer architecture, let me speed it up and increase the clock frequency. It does the same task, single instruction, single data, but do it faster. data is the color that they put in. Okay. The instruction is shoot the paintball. So now we can look at these guys, every, let's say, every column is an SIMD processor. It does the same instruction of shooting the data, which the data is the color that we have here. And then we have multiple of these guys, right? A GPU. Single instruction, multiple data, multiple of these guys, right? But just keep in mind, the data changes, data is the color itself. Yeah. These tubes, in which the bottom up is a paintball. Each of those paintballs will fly across seven feet of space and in 80 milliseconds reach its target. Hopefully, when it's all said and done, it's going to paint the Mona Lisa. GPU painting demonstration. And 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. different data, a lot of simple process, shooting the paintball at the same time. Cool, right? Okay, so I wish I could finish the class right now because it was cool, but we have to continue. So we have the last thing I want to cover here is actually something that I can ask questions in the final exam from this module. So if you haven't been paying attention so far, this is the five minutes that you want to pay attention to the class, okay? So, yeah, we got it. So we have the performance model. Uh, so when we have diverse, when we have a lot of our different architectures, like multi-threaded architectures, sets on like the GPU, different types of CPUs, it's always helpful to have a simple model that gives us an insight about the performance of different architectures. Okay. So this model is called roofline model that we're gonna talk about in the next slide. Before getting there, we need to talk about arithmetic intensity. So arithmetic intensity, or AI, is a ratio of floating point operations in a program to the number of data bytes, pay attention to every term, data bytes, not data words, data bytes access from main memory, not cache. Right? So arithmetic intensity is a number of floating point operations divided by number of data bytes accessed from main memory, okay? So now with having arithmetic intensity in mind, let's talk about the roofline model. So the roofline model is a model that ties floating point performance, arithmetic intensity, and memory performance together in a two-dimensional graph. It follows the relation that you see here. Attainable gigaflops per second. Flop is floating point operations. Gigaflops per second is equal to minimum of peak memory bandwidth multiplied by arithmetic intensity and peak floating point performance. Okay, so now let's have an example to give you an idea about how it works. So let's see, say we have an AMD uh, processor that is dual core, it is running at 2 gigahertz with a peak floating point performance of 16 gigaflops per second and a peak memory bandwidth of 16 gigabytes per second. So peak memory bandwidth is 16 gigabytes, peak floating point performance is 16 gigaflops per second. So if you follow this relation here, when arithmetic intensity is small, let's say one over eight, we multiply arithmetic intensity by peak memory bandwidth, which is 16, and it gives us two. Two is smaller than 16, which is the peak floating point performance, right? So then attainable gigaflops would be two. 
then there's a linear relation. We increase the arithmetic intensity to 1 over 4, we get a tandem of flops of 4. Then we divide it to a half, we multiply the peak memory bandwidth by arithmetic intensity of half, 1 over 2. It gives us 8, and at arithmetic intensity 1, we reach the peak floating point performance. After that point, increasing the arithmetic intensity is not going to change the tangible peak of flops per second because this side of this equation is larger than the peak volume point performance. And then the tangible peak of flops is going to saturate. Okay, so this is the roof line model. So, what kind of question I can give you from this? So let's say we have a computer system with a memory bandwidth of, this is exactly the question you can get in the final exam. A computer system with a memory bandwidth of 12.8 gigabytes per second and a peak computational throughput of 10 gigaflops per second. So these are the assumptions that we have. We have the data type of the res, mat, and vec arrays that are double. The vec array, this is an important information, fits an unchip cache, so you don't need to include access to this array in the calculation. Okay, so when we mention this, we provide this information. We don't even have to provide that information, by the way, because I already mentioned that when you look at arithmetic intensity, we only care about the main memory, the data from the main memory. So if I say that part of this array, it doesn't even have to be a specific array, it can say 30% of data is in the cache. What it means is that you shouldn't calculate, you shouldn't use that 30% within the arithmetic intensity calculation. Okay? So this information here, when we say that the VEC arrays are, are fits within, within the on-chip cache, we're basically saying that don't include this in the arithmetic intensity calculation. Okay? So what is the expected performance of this computer when hosting a loop? Below. We have two loops, we have an outer loop and an inner loop, and then it's a multiply and accumulation. We multiply arrays from mat, uh, elements from the mat array and deck array, and add the result with res array and put the result back in res. Okay, so the first thing we need to do from the attainable gigaflops equation is finding the arithmetic intensity. What was our expanding intensity? It was number of floating point operations divided by number of data bytes accessed from main memory. Okay. So how many floating point operations do I have here? Can you tell me? Let's make it a little bit simple. How many floating point operations I have just in this line? Question simple. So what does this instruction do? It multiplies that command and add it with rest, right? So how many floating point operations do I have here? Two. Two, right? What are those two? Standard? Uh, well, the multiplication of the matrix at i, j, and then the vector at j. Yeah. And then you add add that to res at i. Yeah. So we have two floating point operations right, in that line. But now, if I look at the loop, what is the total number of floating point operations I have here? Still two. Who thinks it's still two? Okay, just keep like this. So if not two, what is it? Go ahead. Two multiplied by m multiplied by n, right? Because of the boot. Does that make sense? So we repeat this instruction m times and m times m times in the inner loop, and then we have n times in the outer loop. So n times m times two is the total number of floating point operations I have here. So now let's talk about the data bytes access. So in this instruction, regardless of this information that I provided here, 
just for now ignore this part. How many bytes do we need to access to in the main memory? So first consideration is a double precision floating point. So one value in a double precision floating point is how many bytes? Eight. So we have double precision floating point 64 bits equal to eight bytes. Okay. So now for each of these guys, we need to access eight bytes. So with that information, what's the total bytes we need to access to for this line? Ten four. Ian? One four. Y twenty four? Eight, eight, eight. Eight here for loading back. Eight here for loading man. And eight for storing rest. Is that correct? Good thing is correct. You should have an opinion. Okay. Andrew thinks it's correct. Rahul thinks it's correct. If not, Allison, what's the correct answer? I have no idea. You have no idea. <laughs> Who else has no idea? Okay. Good job. Um, so if this is not the right answer, what is the right answer? 16. 16. Why 16? Well, I think they, they don't need to store to the memory. Thank you. So, yeah, so ignore that point. You know, if, if, I, I mentioned that for now, let's ignore that VEC is not working with the main memory. Ignore this, this piece of information. So 24 is right, but there is a small problem. Tim, do you have an idea? So we do, we do load res2, right? Because we want to add this result for multiplication with res. So we load vec, we load math, we load res. We do the multiplication on the math and vec, and then add it with res and store it back to res. Okay, but because we don't work with VEC here, we don't care about the VEC in arithmetic intensity, then it's 24. So looking at this, but this is a line, we have the same n times n here. We have eight byte for loading res, we have eight byte for loading mat, and eight byte for storing res. We don't include the VEC because it's in the cache, okay? So now, if we do the math here, we get one over 12 flops per byte. Now with this information, we can go and find that attainable gigaflops per second. So attainable gigaflops per second is the minimum of peak memory bandwidth, which is 12.8, multiplied by arithmetic intensity, which is one over 12 flops per byte. And if you multiply these two, we're gonna get 12.8 divided by 12 gigaflops per second. The byte of byte is gonna cancel out each other. And then on the other side, we have the peak throughput or peak performance of 10 gigaflops per second. Okay? So this number is smaller and is equal to 1.067 gigaflops per second. And then attainable gigaflops would be equal to that one. This question, by the way, was a qualifying exam question a couple of years, three years ago. You can find it on the Dr. Fenner's page. Any questions? Okay, we're good here. That's module nine. So I do wanna wrap up the class with going over the things that we wanna, uh, it's important for me for the final exam. So we have nine modules, but as I promised, we're not gonna have questions from nine modules. So let's go to the content. So these are the modules that we have here. Uh, there's not going to be any questions from module one, which is computer abstraction. We are going to have questions from module two, which is fundamental of quantitative analysis, but most probably it's going to be an indirect question, right? So you need that kind of information that we provided in module two and the memory hierarchy and the different parts of the, you know, mo different modules in module seven. That information about CPI, 
all these calculations exist in module two, and it's actually important. There's not going to be a direct question from module three, which is instructions and architecture. Same story for instruction and coding. And module five, which is computer arithmetic and floating point. Okay? So, before, so the only module that we're going to ask questions from before one term exam one is module two. After that, we're going to include everything. So module six is NIPS processor. So looking at NIPS processor, we, um, I mean, basically, you need to know what NIPS processor is to answer the instruction level problems and all the questions do. But there is an opportunity, like similar to the questions that we got in the assignments, I can still give you questions like this. I can still come up with new instructions and tell you to change the architecture to the scientists, you know, have the control signals and so on. So we can get questions from module six. Yeah. Module seven is instruction level parallelism, and definitely we're gonna have some questions from that. Set module eight, same story for module nine. Okay, so seven, eight, nine, six, seven, eight, nine. Seven, eight, nine is everything we covered after the midterm exam one. As the after the first one third of the class. So seven, eight, nine, you're gonna have questions. Module six is something that we covered in the first one third of the class, but we're still gonna have, we might have questions from this. And module two, which is the quantitative, <coughs> fundamental of quantitative analysis, we're definitely gonna have a question. It might not be a direct question, but we can have indirect questions in different in other modules. Okay, so we still have 